Good morning. So today I'm going to be doing my defense on the scalable, pluggable, and fault tolerant multimodal situational awareness data stream management systems. Um, which in, this is about the updates to uh, and improvements done to disaster record. Um, primarily, a lot of the work was done in the information extraction from images. So there's a lot of work with uh, different kinds of image analysis and also um, large-scale architectural changes to the project uh, as it was for basically a demo and then turning into a full-scale web application. So a little bit about me. My name is Michael Parton. I'm currently working on my uh, Master's in Computer Science at Wright State. Um, got my Bachelor's in Computer Engineering in 2017 from Wright State. Hold an associate's in electronic engineering technology from Sinclair. Here I worked on uh, Twitteris, did uh, a lot of work with Magpie, uh, which is the data collector for Twitteris, expanding the data collection capabilities of that system, the monitoring system for Twitteris, and worked on a few plugins at the political association, implementing uh, some work that was done by the researchers here. I also did some work with the system administration, uh, the OpenStack cluster, Ceph and some AWS work as well. Currently work at uh, Cognovi Labs where I'm working on multilingual natural language processing projects. So what we're going to go over today is uh, the changes and updates and improvements that I've made to disaster records. Um, so we're going to go over the deployment architecture which has been modified and changed, the way that the whole project is deployed, uh, which leads us into the microservice architecture which is what it's built in around this whole architecture of microservices. Um, I have made improvements upon campaign management so that we can create new campaigns and manage them, manage the data sources that are related for those campaigns. Uh, like I mentioned, a lot of the work was in the imaging, pro image processing pipeline and how I utilize these models and retrain them for specific tasks that are related to disaster record. Um, the location name extraction tool, which was uh, developed here by uh, Hussein and others uh, for um, extracting location mentions within text, which is integrated into this project, uh, built an API for that, so we'll talk about that. Finally, we'll talk about multimodal analysis and future work. And these are some of the technologies utilized here, which we're going to go into. But before we do that, let's... Uh, get a little bit of a recap of what disaster record really is. It's a tool used to provide event-centric situational awareness um, analysis in real time. So events such as disasters or social movements are heterogeneous in nature uh, with many modalities and sources. And disaster record is designed to combine this information from various modalities and, and sources in a meaningful way to help gather a more complete analysis of a given situation that's occurring. So the work that's been done previously, disaster record, comes from uh, the efforts of many great minds here at NOESIS and Wright State, um, along with collaboration from Ohio State. A uh, demo was uh, created uh, for the IBM Call for Code Challenge. At that time, it uh, was analyzing one specific event, which was the 2015 Chennai flood event. And the work done here, um, showcases the capabilities of disaster record. Um, the system at that time lacked uh, an area such as flexibility, scalability, and portability. Uh, it was kind of a rigid demo, uh, lots of hard-coded uh, things for the Chennai data set. Um, it, it showcased all the features that the, the software had, but you couldn't create a new campaign, you couldn't um, go and monitor some other event that's happening. So a lot of the efforts here are to solve those, those issues. So I'm going to talk about the deployment architecture. One of the key components of the deployment architecture is the Ansible um, technology, which is an automation tool used in cloud computing. And, and really any, anywhere you have a large number of servers that you need to um, deploy code, update, and uh, modify and maintain. Uh, if you have a system that has a thousand different servers, 
on it and you need to update all of them, you're not going to want to go into each one and update. So this tool allows you to be able to run a playbook and perform those tasks across a thousand different machines all at one keystroke. Uh, this is very powerful. The playbooks look like, like on the right here, they're like scripts that you can write out to perform these tasks. And it even has uh, the capability to do what's called templating with the Jinja technology. Um, here on the left you can see in the double curly braces a um, variable is going to be replaced there. So you can keep all of your host names or other variables that need to be filled in in the different files in another location, just in one file, and everywhere that's going to be referenced it'll be changed as you're deploying the code out. So, very, very useful tool there. Another tool is, um, another technology that we use is Docker. And Docker helps um, to solve dependency issues in development and also going from development into deployment onto a production environment. Um, it actually makes it so that it's, it's very much the same. You, you, you create your, your product on your local development system and by the time you're done, it's in a container, it's containerized, and you can ship it up into a server that supports the Docker containerization environment. So it kind of makes uh, going from development to production very simple, and uh, you won't have any, many conflicts with dependency issues. Which goes hand in hand with the Kubernetes uh, technology that we're using here, because Kubernetes is a containerized management system. So it's what is handling these Docker containers. You can build these Docker containers, uh, which are, you know, your environment contains all of your dependencies that you have. You wrap it into that container and you'll be able to ship it up to the Kubernetes environment and your software will run there just like it did on your development system. You won't have to make modifications for the server. Some other benefits of Kubernetes are that it's scalable, self-healing, and highly extensible. It um, offers its, its built-in reliability uh, where you can launch uh, replication uh, factors within the, the um, environment so that you don't have to, so, so it'll, it'll heal if something crashes, it'll bring another one up immediately. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, in this, we use the Fusion base image and the reason for that being that, um, which, is, which is a container you can get from Docker uh, Hub. You can get many different software solutions from Docker Hub. Um, many of you probably know about Docker Hub. Um, but uh, the Fusion Base image is more like a virtual machine rather than a single service. So it allows you to kind of trans transfer over from if you're used to working on virtual machines in a full Ubuntu or Linux environment, this is more like that. So you can set up your software there and work in this image, which will feel more like a virtual machine. Uh, on the right here, the way that the Kubernetes works is we have pods. You can see these different pods, which contain containers within them. These would be Docker containers within them. And these two nodes right here are the actual physical nodes in our environment we have. So we, uh, when, you, when you launch a, uh, a pod, it's like the, it's the container, it's a, also a service, and we'll get into that, and the storage, and all that resides on a particular actual host node. So this is kind of just the way that it all works graphically. Well, well, why is this uh, slash 1 GB, 20 MB, what is it? Are you providing specific space for different processes or what? Yeah, you can, um, in our system, this one on the left here, the 10 GB, mm -hmm. would be like the network file, uh, network storage. We use Ceph in our case. And with Ceph, you can divvy it up and create volumes. So these volumes would be created from that massive pool and, and uh, attached to How do you estimate the, the size of that volume? How do you estimate? Yeah. Well, you actually uh, will... In this kind of file right here, this is the deployment YAML. This is where you actually define your service that you're going to launch. 
and you can define like the memory, you can define, uh, I'm not sure if this one shows the uh, storage, but it would be something like, like here where you would define the storage and the amount that you need, kind of like uh, provisioning a volume for the particular pod. You can say I need 16 gigs or 32 gigs for this particular pod, this service. But I would guess that I would see that that would be just a guesswork for somebody, right? Mm -hmm. You would subscribe uh, over estimate, right? Significantly. Um, you normally would would have to choose some size. You'd have to have some kind of size that you're going to start with. Um, Ceph does allow you to modify that, and you can change it later. You can expand the volume, and then you have more room. So. That's one of the great things about SAP and the volume is that you can create with that. Uh, you get a, a dashboard, which is actually a service within the Kubernetes environment. It's its own pod that you launch, and it provides you a window into all of your launched containers and pods and services, stateful sets. There's all these kinds of objects with Kubernetes that you create and define with these deployment YAML files like this. <clears throat> you notice at the top on the left it says kind. This is a service. You'll define the service, which is generally your ports that you're going to open up for this particular service. Kubernetes is kind of a replacement or an analogy, analogy to um, OpenStack. OpenStack is where we launch our virtual machines. Kubernetes is where we would launch our containers. So it's a place to house the projects. Also supports uh, you have a command line interface for it, um, and this second line here, the kube control apply would be for actually applying that YAML file. And what you're going to get when you run the apply is it's either going to create everything that's in that YAML file, that definition, or it's going to modify what's what's been defined and make it item potent so it's going to result in the same uh, state at the end of that run. So it ensures that you're going to get what you're asking for every time. And you have other commands like uh, kube control git pods. Uh, the hyphen O is the uh, output. We want the wide output here showing <coughs> all the columns. So here we're listing all the pods that are running, all the services that are running within a certain namespace. And this last Line down here, this uh, kube control namespace dr execute it. It's a long command there, but that one is actually how you get into your container. You can actually SSH basically into your container, then take control just like you would a virtual machine. So that leads us into the microservice architecture. So, so whatever uh, tools that you described just now, so either a uh, comprehensive tutorial kind of document that somebody can <laughs> read and get a broader big picture how these fit, things fit in? Yeah, I mean, um, I do link in, I didn't link here, but I do have a link to, there's a Google Drive uh, folder that I have that has extensive examples. Okay. I've given it to some people here already, but I've included it uh, in the links in the slides at some point in here. So there's some more information, more detailed information on how to utilize these technologies. We also bought books, like we bought a book for Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And Shri has it right away. I think, yeah, I've, I've worked with Shri and Michelle to, uh, to showcase this stuff. And so they, they're pretty familiar with it. So the microservice architecture. Um, Microservice.io describes the microservice architecture as uh, an architectural style that structures an application as a collection of services that are highly maintainable and testable, loosely coupled, independently deployable, organized around business capabilities, and owned by a small team, which I think that what we're trying to do here fits a lot of those categories there. And um, this is an example of the uh, disaster record system, and I'm going to go through an example of how one interacts with the system and how the different microservices interact with each other. So 
in this case here, uh, a user is asking to set up a campaign, and they're going to interact with the web host, which is a microservice on this in this architecture, with the, which then is going to update the SQL database, where she's going to define a campaign given a, a name, a bounding box, a geolocation, a centroid, the data s sources that she wants to put into this campaign, all that goes into the SQL database. Then there's a, a DR worker uh, service in the back end that detects that change in the SQL database. It's always scanning and looking for new changes. And it's going to launch the core, which is the processing um, master, basically, for this uh, back end, which is all the processing um, microservice microservices that exist back there. So it's going to reach out to the different ones for, uh, here we have like the Twitter stream microservice is going to pull in, start pulling in data, and then processing it through like the object detection. It may actually hit all of these, but this is just showcasing you know, a little bit here. And then it's going to write these, uh, uh, the output of, of these um, inferences and object detection, all the, all the different analysis points here from all these different microservices get wrote back into Elasticsearch, updating the knowledge graph that's, that is representing the situation as it's happening. So we have all different modes of data being analyzed here, like the text classifier is taking the text, analyzing it for needs, and updating into uh, Elasticsearch for the needs for that particular tweet that came in, object detection, detecting all the different objects within the image. So, so the core spawns the microservices? The core doesn't spawn them. The microservices are always available. Mm -hmm. They're always running. And you can just hit them, ping them with a, with a request, and they'll respond back. So, so core is the application uh, specific thing, and then it makes use of all these other pieces that are around. Right. And those, there's different cores that get launched for different topologies. So basically when the uh, user defines their campaign and they choose what data sources and what kind of analysis they want to do, it will spawn a specific core that routes the, the information through the different uh, available microservices. So is each core a different campaign then? That's what I'm, I'm not clear on that. A campaign could actually have multiple cores okay. if it has multiple data sources uh, because if you have like the Twitter data source and you've selected you want to do um, standard analysis of uh, the object detection, I want to know how many people, vehicles, and animals are in the, uh, the images, then that will be using the object detection there. But if you want to do an analysis on, let's say, aerial imagery, like drone imagery, that will choose a different uh, pipeline. But those could both be in one campaign. Okay. You could say, here's my here's my Twitter data source, and here <coughs> is uh, the drone imagery data source. And then, can I run multiple campaigns? Yes. Or nested campaigns, or something like that? Uh, not nested, but, okay. it, but multiple campaigns, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll ask about the nesting one. So, so, the tweet, <laughs> so Twitter source and analysis will be in one core, and then drone images and analysis will be in another core? Mm -hmm. So that's the... Yeah, the core is actually going to route it. It's basically the, the routing, the topology of the analysis being done. So when it launches it, it there, there's different configurations you can launch it in. And then I have separate representations, separate knowledge graphs for every campaign that I'm running? That, that's correct. Okay. Yep. What's the difference between object detection and image analysis? The image analysis, uh, which we'll, we'll get into the difference of that a little bit later, but to answer your question right now, the image analysis here is more of the inception level. Uh, the inception model just gives a inference for the whole image, so it'll give a class for that one particular image. So flood yeah. or no flood? That right, flood. exactly. We use it for flood or not flood, a binary classifier. Mm -hmm. The object detection is going to come back with a list of objects that were detected within that image. So it is a classifier, basically. Yeah, exactly. So um, once the core is uh, either done analyzing or there was some kind of error or anything else that's going to update the database with the um, basically the status of that analysis and the user can always see what's going on. It's going to notify if there was some kind of error uh, it's not able to process the information. 
So these, these microservices here are basically built using a flask. And uh, I, a lot of people are pretty familiar with flask at all. Anybody? You are? <laughs> so uh, flask is a great little micro framework. Um, it allows you to create endpoints and you can wrap your functionality within those endpoints. Um, here is a little example where we have flask and we have the object detection script within it that's using the TensorFlow model. And you can just have an endpoint that says classify and give it the URL, the image, and it's going to come back with the response of here's the objects and the classes and where they were within the image. So it makes so, it. So, so what's the, within the Flask is what is locally developed and then you verify it using the Flask wrapper? Well, um, Basically, like the object detection would be a, a script that would do this, taking in an image URL and downloading the image and um, running it through the TensorFlow model and then giving you back the results. All Flask is doing is allowing us to put it into an endpoint. Um, for example, actually it's a little bit later in the slide, so we'll, we'll come back to that. And I'll show you. It, it dives in a little bit deeper to how, how this works. So, I want to talk a little bit about TensorFlow. Um, it's, it's not a, a microservice that I'm using, but it, it's within a lot of the services for the image analysis. So, um, TensorFlow, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of it, is a software library for creating stateful data flow graphs uh, for easy deployment of computational topologies, um, allowing you to define your uh, basically dimensionality of the data you're going to take in how you're going to perform different mathematical operations through the topologies. Um, it's used a lot in machine learning, and uh, there's a lot of high-level frameworks um, that utilize TensorFlow as a backend. A lot of interesting stuff being done with it today. Like on the left here, you see like a convolutional network uh, where windows are slid across the data to produce uh, convolution, uh, like reduction in dimensionality. Uh, the deep neural, or the deep layers here, the uh, fully connected layers used for learning. Um, and, and some of the newer stuff, the uh, gated arrays or the recurrent neural networks, like LSTN, that have an element of memory within them are able to learn and forget, actually, also. So I don't get into a lot of the theory behind this, but the application is more of what I've used it for. Another service that we use is SQL, SQL Lite specifically. This is where the campaign definitions live. When a user defines it, it's going to keep the campaign name, the centroid, the bounding box, all the information that relates to that. As you said, uh, the in Elasticsearch does have an index for each one of the campaigns, so they're separated in that way. In Elasticsearch, um, again, you can see the uh, different indices. They actually have multiple indices per campaign. We actually have the tweet needs is, is one that carries over from Shruti's work with this. She was uh, basically putting the information as it comes in into one index, processing it, and saving all the uh, analysis into another. And I've, I've kept with that same kind of schema. So this is the kind of analysis that would end up in the Elasticsearch. Uh, database. Um, you would have here we see like objects, how many objects were detected with the object detector, the is flood from the inference model, the location mentions from the Linux tool, um, and estimated water height, which I'll get into later. Uh, so, so, uh, so like I was asking you earlier, so basically you can tag these JSON objects with location and potentially turn that into knowledge graph and then do a text-based querying uh, at the top? Uh, yeah, everything ends up in a into the Elasticsearch database, which I'm considering the knowledge graph, the knowledge base is, is there, and the search capabilities that Elasticsearch extends, that allows for, um, I think is is good enough to, to, to be able to query spatially and temporally the information that we want to pick up on. So, so, so right now, 
the actual knowledge graph is basically whatever Elasticsearch uh, contains and enables you to query. Yes. Yeah. Is there any instance management? Instance management stuff in here. So I see a person, vehicle, and animals at time equals one. Uh, in the same geographic location at time equals two, do I know that those are the same instances, or are they going to be indicated as separate? I'm, I'm, I'm not requiring that you do this. I just want to know whether you've done anything with we this. We have problem. not done anything with that yet, okay. and that would be that would be an issue. So uh -huh. you can't rely on this is a total mm -hmm. count. This is really just a count of that image. Right. So we don't know if that overlaps with right. another. Right. Okay. So another service is the Linux service, the location name extraction tool developed by Hussain here at Oasis, and I'm sure others were involved with it as well. Um, and this is a very interesting tool. So given the, giving a bounding box, such as the one here shown around Houston, and you have text coming in, it's going to find the entities, entity mentions, uh, within that bounding box in the text here. So this is highlighting the ones that it found here, like Houston First, City Hall, Hoosier Road, Houston itself. It pulls out and extracts that information. It also does, uh, we can find the actual geolocation of these entities, um, but a lot of times <coughs> there is a disambiguation problem where we have 30 or so for Hoosier Road, because we don't know exactly where on the road that really mention is talking about. I think Hussein said he was working on that issue. Mm -hmm. So be interested to see where he's gotten with that. So we'll talk a little bit about campaign management. Um, like I said before, this initially was a demo and uh, going from the demo to being able to create new campaigns um, required uh, some kind of means to define these campaigns, now we can define them uh, temporally, spatially, and to also give the data sources, such as the Twitter stream, or the uh, drone imagery, or uh, even data sets that we've created, we pull information out of Twitteris and use that to, because uh, we have monitored a few uh, disasters and hurricanes and such in Twitteris. Um, as far as creating multiple campaigns and the multiple user environment in it, um, for, for being able to create or modify the campaign requires uh, credentials. But being able to view it doesn't require any credentials right now. So you can go to any campaign and view it and interact with it, uh, but you can't modify anything. So if you go up to the gear icon and try to modify it, it's going to ask for your credentials. So now we'll talk about the image processing pipeline, which is a lot of the a lot of the work that I did on this project, <clears throat> uh, and what we did specifically with um, the object detection using the SSD MobileNet Coco model, retraining it. Um, also used the Deep Lab semantic segmentation model, and also used uh, a retrained Inception V3 classifier. So these are the three like off-the-shelf products that I used and also retrained them. Except for the se semantic segmentation, I didn't retrain. It worked great out of the box, and I'll show you why. But this, this is interesting, too, because uh, here we can see the on the top left the confidence in the flood for that particular image is almost 100% flood. But the one on the, in the bottom left there, which is a computer-generated image, it actually performed not so well on that, and that's good. We, we don't want to actually classify that as a real flood. So we were looking for real flood images, so it did pretty well on those. Uh, so I'm going to go into how we retrain these models, uh, create how we create standalone um, inference uh, scripts for them and how to wrap those in Flask. So we're going to go over each one of them in detail. And why did I use these models? Well, they came from uh, a source that has a lot of community support, active repositories, 
active. I checked the other day, it was active four days ago. So they're still active. <laughs> they were active two years when I was using, so a lot of people use these, this repository. Thorough documentation and a lot of methods for transfer learning. So it's all there. Uh, and it's, it's at github.com TensorFlow Models. So they have a lot of research projects on there. And you can probably find something that is in line with the research that you're doing if you're working on image processing and kind of see what's, what's going on with it. So the... So uh, the previous one was just flood and no, non-flood, that classification, right? <laughs> uh, for which one? So this is for flood versus... This one is the object <laughs> detection. We're gonna, I'm going to go over the object detector first, and then I'm going to go over the flood, not flood. So the TensorFlow you used for uh, which one? Oh, these are actually both TensorFlow. For both. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll find, um, well, in the object detection one, I think the name of that project, that research project, is actually object detection under the TensorFlow models. Sure. So um, here is a walkthrough of provisioning to set up your work environment to do a retraining of the object detection. Uh, so basically, it's as simple as cloning that repo, which is the second line there, after you've made a workspace for yourself, and then um, exporting some uh, path variables. I, I really highly recommend using virtual environments in Python to keep your workspace clean. Uh, so utilize virtual environments, create a virtual environment, and install the packages that you need within there so you don't have any kind of issues. Or you can use a Docker container too. That would be even better. So um, after you've uh, cloned it and made your um, uh, virtual environment, then you want to basically prep these different folders for your annotations. And you're going to have to annotate some data or find some annotated data or get somebody to annotate your data. Um, and there's a great tool out here called Label Image uh, that I found, which is awesome. It allows you to draw bounding boxes around something and give it a label. And it works really well. Once you give it a label, it'll pop up again so you don't have to keep typing it in. It's really nice. It works really well. So once you've annotated your images that you want to train on, then you copy all that information over to your test and train folder that you've created and install your dependencies that you need. Um, this right here is that link and you'll see it a, a couple of times throughout the slides to the Google Drive that contains a lot more resources. Uh, there's a lot of like scripts that I've wrote to handle a lot of this stuff out there. So you can navigate to this. Some people here already, already have access to it. Um, so once, once you've annotated your data, put it in the right places, you'll need to prep the data. And that will be um, converting these XML annotations to CSV and then converting that CSV into the uh, TF records. Um, so it's a, it's a couple stages, but then once you get it into the TF records, it's ready to train. And um, that's done. You'll need to obtain the mobile net V1 Cocoa model. And I provide a link down here for it. And you can uh, edit your configuration file, which has all your hyperparameters, how many epochs you want to run, the training rate or learning rate, uh, and tons of other things. So then this final command here, this train, Python train, is, is all you'll need to do if everything's in the right place and all your dependencies are installed um, you'll be able to train but, but you'd experiment with all these hyperparameters to get things yeah that's you will definitely need to experiment and that depends on your in, on your data set the size of it and it's really it's a, a matter of trying it out seeing how it works and tweaking it but this is where you'll tweak it in that configuration file I've also included down here a uh, guide that I used to, to, to do this, so it goes into detail. It's kind of what I followed. I believe that um, the, high, the mobile net V1 is, is actually pretty old now. I think V2 or V3 might be what's currently being used. Um, so once you get a good model that's working, then you will export that into a frozen inference graph. This will be 
what's ready for production or your or your standalone scripts. It's um, it's what you'll use to feed images in and get the inferences out. And you won't need a GPU for this anymore. This is frozen inference graph. It's just the model frozen. So, but this is the command to do that. And then you want to test. So there's the standalone um, object detection. Again, on that Google Drive, a script that I wrote to load up the model and take in a image URL and then be able to produce an inference. Uh, on the right, you actually see the output from the apply to image batch script, which actually shows visually the, the um, inferences from this uh, model. And this one was trained on different car parts, um, which is part of the work that I was doing for the flood level detection using uh, objects of known height, basically, mm -hmm. off the ground to be able to determine in the image how high the water level is, using that in combination with the flood or not flood to determine if there is water in the image. So for the so label data set, you use that label image to label all these door handles and those kinds of things and then train it or does it come out of the box? I, that's right. I had to train it on those. Um, some people helped me out, like Asher and Rochelle helped me to... So you have to create the training data set using that label image mm -hmm. uh, tool and... So, yep. And where do you get the height from? Is that, there must be some kind of inference <laughs> going on about well, that. Well, that right. would be from a separate like external database that we would construct. So like the height of the door handle is, mm -hmm. a, is in some other database that says it should be X inches or whatever. Exactly. Off it's tied in with it. So this is only going to tell you that that's a door handle. It doesn't yeah. tell you how high it is. Right. We would have that externally in some other database of known or averaged height. So of, of what do people do? Do they kind of just say uh, there is a? I mean, do you get to know, get get to estimate? This is a first of all a car versus uh, SUV, and hence uh, and, and and then decide or truck, mm. or do you get to know because you know actually there is a federal standard as to where the bumper needs to be at the height that it needs to be for a particular type of vehicle. So that they can, when they hit, they, the bumper hit each other rather than hit the other parts. Okay, so if, if, for example, you know, very tall vehicle, but bumper is high, then it's going to hit uh, and make a lot of damage to your car. So there is so, something about that. But um, I mean, most times you say, oh, this is a subcompact and the vehicle handle is here. Others say, oh, this is a Toyota Corolla. And, um, you know, I know from the and then there's a database somewhere, um, knowledge base that says Corolla handle, you know, is at this height. The height of Corolla itself is this much, the length is this much, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I don't know which, well, what strategy are you? Well, in this strategy, it's very generic and very, like, averaged height on across all vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you're mentioning could be done, uh, it would require a lot more, uh, I think, a lot more models to determine which vehicle this is specifically and then go to a database where that information can be pulled for that specific vehicle. Um, that would take a lot of effort, I think, um, but it could be done. And real I think time? Real time? Uh, near real time? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Um, because uh, the inferences are pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, we're not you know, training anything anymore at that point. It would just be feeding the image in. And that kind of goes to another point of once the image data is downloaded, or the inference has been made, that's cached. So the next time that image is uh, come through the system, okay. You just uh, one last question. Of course, this isn't a perfect car. This one on the left. Right. It is a partial car. Mm -hmm. So how does the logic work? Do you start out with an hypothesis that this is a car, or is it bottom up, or how mm -hmm. do we? How do you manage that? Yeah. That right. Partial pattern matching problem. Right now, it, yeah, I think this would be problematic, and solving that uh, issue with, like, for instance, this one is almost tilted, so right. we can't really even um, trust the inferences that would come from this. There would be some problems with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those those are issues that weren't really um, addressed okay. in this yet. So, MCS question. 
you said you're modeling the height of the flat stack. Uh, is there any measure of the uncertainty of the height that you're measuring? Because, I mean, like uh, she said, uh, some of the images you might not be able to infer the height correctly. Right. Right. Um, <coughs> not specifically, but I do address that we need to have some kind of uncertainty <coughs> measurement not only with this particular flood analysis, but all the analysis is being done. And for the analysis in the end result, basically, as it's all combined, a total uh, confidence in that analysis, which would be a measure from all of them, from all of the pieces of analysis. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty within this, and it's hard to calculate even because of things like the car being tilted we would need to have a model to determine is it a tilted car or the orientation of, of the objects within the image. So right now you can detect tires, handles, that, that's, that's the way it works, right? That's it's, the way it's it works. It's bot, pretty much bottom up. <coughs> you are looking for tires, handles, and whatever, windshields or whatever you have there. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. Right. So, yeah, I think the idea was if we were able to to find a car with a lot of top parts on it, but no lower parts, we can yeah. assume, you, and then we would... You could make the inference that way. We could make the inference, mm -hmm. and then we would say, with the flood, not flood detector, this, this image does have flood water in it, yeah. so the confidence goes up. Okay. And then with the semantic segmentation, we could go from these objects and measure down pixel-wise and know the scale of that particular object also, so we would know the height above the water. But not, not done yet. I mean, that's like a next step of something that needs to be done. Right, exactly, okay. yeah. So there's a lot of... So each part gives you an estimate and then you yeah. put it together. Exactly. So, yeah, that's that's where I was going with, with the um, with the error within within each one is each, each particular object in here gives you a measurement, and I think that would be like a distribution mm -hmm. of those, and we would see maybe a, hopefully a cluster of Agreement. But because the wheel image isn't perfect, it's on, it's going to not be 100% confident that that's a, a wheel, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's not going to be. Um, yeah, so each one of these has a confidence rating. It's probably hard to see back there, but this is like 99% that's sure that that's a wheel. And one more thing. How do we know that these are all attached to the same object? Uh, that could be a, a combination of the semantic segmentation could help with that. Okay. Because that would show where... Mm -hmm where objects issues, yeah. are connected. Okay. So that's where mixing these different models comes in. Understood. So the, le the right one here shows the uh, graphically the output, and the left shows the actual like in, uh, number, numeric output, of what class it is and where it is in the image. So wrapping, wrapping this kind of object detection in Flask is Pretty simple, actually. Um, 23 lines of code with some spaces and actually some caching going on. Um, the only caveat here is that lines 8 and 9 are actually importing the object detector, which is this script here, which loads up the model and performs the inference. Um, and the whole idea with the Flask uh, framework here is that we would when, when the Flask application starts, it loads the model, it's ready to go, it's just waiting on input. So that, that way we have a function that's um, taking in the image, downloading that image data, and running it through the model and returning the inference. We don't have to wait for the model to load again. It's already been loaded, which is a lot of times the longest part of running these. So for retraining the uh, Inception V3 model, um, it's, ve it's very similar, um, but not actually, so it's, it's interesting. But um, in this way, uh, I started using the fine-tune Inception V3 on flowers script. There's a script on the TensorFlow uh, models repo under the SLIM, which is the framework, it's a higher level framework that I use. Um, so basically utilize this uh, script when it made the changes to point towards a different data set. Um, and then you can see here, you need to change the download and convert script, the download and convert under the data set script. Uh, so you need to create a few, a few scripts. 
modeling them after the ones that are already there, and put your data there. And you just separate your classes into different folders. So you'll have a training data folder where, in this case, I had flood and then not flood. Right? And you run the train image classifier script pointing it at the different uh, folders, the data set name from those scripts that you created before, and you'll begin training. I think of where the, uh, it's been a while since I've done this one, but the hyperparameters, I think there are arguments you can feed into the train image classifier script here. There's also, uh, in that Google folder that I mentioned before, there's some more information about that. But creating the uh, flood and not flood model used um, I used 6,000 flood examples and 4,000 non-flood counterexamples. The counterexamples were made up from urban setting in environments that just didn't show flood examples, and also uh, things like pictures of people, pictures of this text here, um, because this is the kind of stuff that we see coming in to the to the campaign as we're monitoring an event as it's happening. So we wanted to to work well on this kind of data. Um, the binary classifier was tested on a randomly selected group of 200 images from that 2015 Chennai flood data set, which represents the kind of data that we expect to see. Um, of that, we had um, 49 uh, were correctly labeled flood, um, 7 of them were incorrectly labeled as flood, so they were not flood, labeled as flood. And then um, 16 were incorrectly labeled as not flood, so they actually were flood. And then 128 were labeled as non-flood. This gave us a precision of 87.5 and 75.4% recall, giving it an F-score of 0.81. The Inception V3 model reportedly has 78.1% um, precision with the thousand classes that it was originally trained on. And this was trained on just two classes. So it seems like you, know, you narrow those classes down, squash them into two actually performs pretty well. Um, there's a paper uh, decap, I mention it in, in here a little bit later, uh, that mentioned, that talks about why retraining these models works and transfer, the transfer learning process. Um, the low-level features for all these thousand classes of images are learned within that model. Um, and then tr transferring that to a different problem like the flood, not flood, works out pretty well because all those features are already learned within that model. So in production, um, the confidence had to be 80% or higher for a flood for it to classify it as a flood. So we didn't rely on like a 50-50. It had to be 80% or higher to be a flood. So uh, the one on the left there actually shows a flooding uh, mm -hmm. picture, but it was classified as a non-flood. Um, and it probably just, I would imagine, because it didn't have enough features within that image. There's a little bit of water in the background. But it's it confident, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it wasn't very confident. It was kind of 50 50. So, uh, in the same way, wrapping the inception uh, retrained model in a uh, class here to, actually, this is just the standalone, sorry. Um, so we have uh, functions here stubbed out, uh, get image, which downloads the image from the URL, uh, and resizes it for the inception model, it has to be a certain dimensionality to go into the model. Um, so when it's all said and done, and the, the bottom two lines are all that you'll need to run from this class, you instantiate the class and do a load from your image and what model you want to use. This is kind of set up to use multiple models if we trained on other tasks, which another task that I think would be very beneficial is the aerial and ground level. If we can create a binary classifier to determine the orientation, so then that will choose object detection models later on down the pipeline. Same thing, wrapping it in flask, flood detection, talking to the TensorFlow model, set up the endpoints just like we did with the other. 
Um, so the, the deep lab is the semantic segmentation. Um, according to deep lab, GitHub page, deep lab is a state of the art deep learning model for semantic image segmentation where the goal is to assign semantic labels to every pixel. So it's different than the object detection. We're going to actually label every pixel with a certain class. And that's what's done here on the ADE 20K data set, which is what's used to train the original Deep Lab. So um, the Deep Lab is used uh, as is to detect the boundary of water within an image in the um, flood height estimator. Uh, the results of the deep lab analysis combined with object detection, inference, and external knowledge, as I mentioned, of the heights of those uh, can result in some very powerful intelligent analysis. So I'll explain a little bit more detail later on how, how that works. And there's a standalone for the uh, deep lab as well. All these scripts, the standalone scripts, are in that Google Drive. There is no uh, model, there is no Flask uh, application for the, the semantic segmentation yet. Um, the output is not like the other ones, it's not uh, a JSON response of here's your classes or the inference. This is actually another bitmap, this is another image output, so we don't really, I don't think Elasticsearch is the best place to store that kind of information in the analysis, it's, so we're not there yet with, with having that in the pipeline. So, Why is it not the best place? Too, too much low-level detail? or um, It's not text. It's not text. It's, it not, needs to be text. Well, but, the, but each pixel has a text attribute, right? That's, that's true that it would, we would be able to map each pixel to a, a particular class. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we'd want to store basically the bitmap Someplace else? Yeah, someplace mm -hmm. else. It could be stored in Elasticsearch. It could be, but I just don't think that's the best place for it. To, for for speed-wise Yeah, analysis. it would slow down processing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we'll come back to the, um, the semantic segmentation, how that's wrapped up in, into uh, the flood detection, I mean the uh, flood estimator. But uh, I'm going to talk about the work I did on the Location Name Extraction API first. So in the um, Linux API, um, this allows users to interact with the Linux tool through uh, RESTful API endpoints. And it also utilizes Redis as uh, a caching mechanism to help speed up the querying that's being done. So here we'll walk through an example of someone interacting with the system. And she's going to initialize a zone, giving the bounding box and the name and a token, which is her uh, authentication token. So with this system now you can actually have um, a authentication so a user can be limited also to how many zones they can create, how many queries they can do on it. So it's going to, first thing it's going to do is check with the SQLite. Um, the authentication and check the limits, make sure that she's allowed to create this zone. And then it's going to query the uh, Redis to see if that uh, zone has been set up. And then it's, it, it's not, so this is initializing it. So it's going to bring in and, and prime Redis with the, uh, the zone that's created from Photon. So it's basically taking a chunk of the Photon database and storing it into Redis, which is an in-memory data storage. So it's going to be a quick lookup. Um, then the user is going to say that they want to extract in the New Orleans. So they're going to hit the extract endpoint, uh, giving the campaign, I mean the zone, the New Orleans, the uh, authentication token, and a list of texts that they want to extract information or extract the location mentions from. And the system's going to immediately respond with a token, not the results, but a, a results token. Because it's still, even with Redis, this is going to take some time. And I have some 
examples of how long it takes for different size zones. So then the query is going to be done using the Redis. It's going to be querying the results that were stored earlier from Photon in Redis. And the user can pull at this time to see if their results are ready. There's a command line interface for this that uh, does a exponential back off for the polling. So once it's ready, she sends in, uh, she accesses the results endpoint with the token and then gets the results back that includes the text and the location mentions, which um, <coughs> on the endpoints here, um, there are two kinds of extract. There's the bulk extract and the full bulk extract. The bulk extract is just going to give you back IDs of the location mentions, and that's it. And then you have to use the um, get info or the geo info to get the information for each of those IDs. But if you do the full bulk